and welcome to Queer Magic. Today we've got Mortellus on the show. Uh, they are a Gardnerian Wiccan, um, author of Do I Have to Wear Black, a mortician, funeral directrix, um, author, witch and necromancer. So yeah, uh, so how long have you been involved in paganism and Wicca and parts adjacent? That is a tricky question. I know people don't like this kind of answer because it, it sounds a way, but <laughs> um, yeah, I grew up as part of the Irish diaspora. My, my great grandmother was an immigrant and she had very druidic practices in action, if not name. I mean, she was definitely some kind of Christian that didn't go to church, but she had a lot of those things in her life. So they certainly influenced me as a child, but I think that I became thinking of myself differently. I reached a point where I was thinking about myself differently as, um, as just sort of not Christian and, and definitely sort of thinking about things in a pagan way, whatever that means, um, after my suicide attempt at age five. Mm. After yeah. that attempt, I, during that attempt, it, your viewers can hear this on on podcasts and things. I've talked about it, and it's in my book. I, I talk about it there, but um, I died. I I was in a coma for four days and um, flatlined. They failed to revive me, and they declared me dead. About eight minutes later, I spontaneously revived. Wow! Rather than a near death experience, they call that the Lazarus effect. Mm. Which simply return from the dead. But what seemed like eight minutes here was really a very long time for me in what I was experiencing. Mm. And I'm certainly willing to accept that it's the you know, coma addled death throes of a five-year-old brain, but I met a deity. I experienced the underworld. And you know, I grew up in a home where we didn't have books other than, and then the Bible, we didn't have radio, we didn't have, we didn't watch television, we had none of those things, but I knew that deity when I found her in a book as an adult, everything was as it should have been. And it, it, I call it my tent revival story because it's, it's really hard to sort of discount this experience and, and being able to make that part of my life after I ran away from home as an adult. Mm. So after that experience, I, I, I became very combative in a church environment, um, trying to understand my world and that mostly did not work out for me but I still remember doing things like talking to the moon at night um making what we could argue were spells those sorts of things mm. so from that point on I had these sort of pagan parts of my life but after running away at 17 one of the first things I did was off to the library I went and started digging into books and making a solitary practice, which was very hodgepodge, eclectic kind of, of course it was. Um, and then I immediately married a moron and remained <laughs> in that marriage for 10 years. Um, but uh, it was sort of a closeted, eclectic, solitary for, for that period of time uh, from around 17 to 28 or so. And then, um, then I started seeking Gardnerian witchcraft, I became an initiate, um, and here I am running. You are running a teaching coven, so mostly reviled by the Gardnerian community. But <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. Well, you know, to be honest, I'm reassured because um, <laughs> I was going to ask about that, um, which leads us very neatly into the next um, the next question, which is uh how accommodating or inclusive or affirming of your queerness do you find your tradition oh, gosh. or yeah i mean you can answer that question for your tradition as you have adjusted it if you have adjusted it <laughs> uh, entirely can up to I, you can i like multi-part answer that? <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah i think my answer would be multi-part too so go for it when i was seeking i I don't know, I reached a point in my practice where I was feeling very alone. It was strange for my family. I'm dealing with this recent divorce. I had just come out um, as bi. I had just 
uh, started coming to terms with being non-binary. If I wasn't out, I knew it about myself, you know, and I was trying to make space for it in my head. And mm. there was a lot of upheaval in my life. So one Yule, I, I did a ritual and basically I was just asking the gods to send me a sign of, of where I should go, what I should learn, what I should do. I was looking for family really. Mm. Um, and I got, you and we've all had these moments where you get like a very clear picture of something or a very clear just answer in your mind and I had one of those experiences and it made fuck all sense to me it just, it, <laughs> I was kind of mad about it at the time because what popped into my mind was Long Island and I remember quipping is this is this an instruction or a, a cocktail recipe what is the <laughs> what is the, the answer here yeah I'm I'm just my brain is going hashtag not all Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a few days later, I found myself at the internet and I just I typed in absentmindedly witch plus Long Island or whatever, and of course I found Buckland and so on. Um, did a bit of reading and poking around and found myself on Witchbox sending out messages. There were no covens in my area that were taking students. None. They all said more or less, do not message us. <laughs> we don't want to talk to you. Okay. So I talked to a coven in Pennsylvania who agreed to take me on in their outer court. And we spoke back and forth. And I'm so glad now, honestly, that I didn't wind up there because we would not have been a good fit. I now know. <laughs> but at the time, I didn't know that. Um, but they suggested to me that <clears throat> I should email those to local covens anyway. So see what happens. So I did. And uh, the next morning at about 10 a.m., I got a text message from my now spouse saying that their mother had gotten a very humorous email during the night. <laughs> and they sent me a screenshot of my message, which I, you get that weird like sinking feeling in your stomach and your face becomes devoid of color because they were very closeted I didn't know this about them but I had been dating oh. my child and like in and out of their house every other day I was there all the time so it felt like what kind of impression have I made <laughs> uh, but we all thought it was very funny and coincidental and they took me on as a student yay so good. they're lovely people I love them we've had these conversations so if they watch this video hearts we <laughs> I never felt empowered to say who I was. Just the language, the environment, everything about it led me to believe I needed to pretend I was a woman. Right. <laughs> and I remember even, and, and they, we've talked about it, they know how I feel about this, but um, I would overhear conversations where they were talking about you know, gay people in a craft who were but they're the, they're the right kind of gay because they're very hard guard or this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, it was all this sort of subtle messaging that I, yeah. I needed to stay away, you know, maintain a sort of facade. So I, I did that. I sort of stayed closeted. I didn't come out as non-binary until after I got third degree because I was so scared that they would throw me out. Oh, <laughs> I really was, I was terrified. Um, and I didn't feel like the craft was very welcoming when I was a seeker, when I was studying. I felt like um, LGBTQIA plus people in the craft were very, or in this craft, um, tended to either be very quiet about it or tended to go the extra mile to show that in a circle they could be what was expected of them. Yeah, I've seen that for sure. Um, I mean, I've been having these discussions online for you know 20 years and and doubtless so have you um actually maybe 25 years like since the beginning of the internet in other words so uh yeah i see uh i see a variety of responses to the question i, I will say though that sort of the addendum to those those parts is that um I decided one day, I'm, I was a third degree. I had an initiate at that point. I, I felt very secure, I felt secure. So I very quietly changed the bio on my website to say priestess. 
and I got an email the same day <laughs> from my high priestess saying that I had misspelled. No, that was on purpose. Here's why. And then the debates started about whether I could do that. Ooh. And the question became, was I a woman and a high priestess and therefore entitled to add things and make changes? Or was I this other thing and I should be thrown out? <laughs> and it became this sort of catch to too of what people believed. Um, and I mostly just ignored all of it and didn't care. So it just my, I continued with my life as though it wasn't happening. Um, Best move, yeah. My coven is extremely inclusive. And in fact, we, we have an online um, Zoom-based outer court situation, uh, which is complicated, but we're making it work um, so that we can be more inclusive and take people who've been rejected in other areas. Um, that sort of came to a head after a point when I found out that a coven very near me had been rejecting trans seekers. I chose to take one of them on as a student. Um, they wound up contacting my high priestess. It was a whole thing. And um, they had tried to join one of my fan groups. I have a fan group on Facebook. They tried to join it, I declined it. Um, they sent me a message asking why. And I responded very politely saying that I didn't think that their beliefs about race or inclusivity, et cetera, et cetera, uh, would be very comfortable for the people in my group and therefore I'd make that decision. So they reached out to my high priestess saying that uh, they would never take on a trans student, explained why they thought it was wrong for me to do so, um, noted that, um, trying to find words, um, they noted that they were using their autonomy to say that their own students and seekers could not be involved in those communities. Um, they didn't want to hear topics of inclusivity. They didn't want them to read my books, speak to yeah. me so much as like my Facebook page. It became a dividing point. Mm -hmm. I've had the same shit about my stand for inclusivity as well, for sure. Yeah. I mean, happened. like there was one person who told me that they were told by their high priestess uh, and high priest, I assume, uh, not to come to my workshops at uh, gathers and also not to read my books. So, um, I mean, personally, if somebody tells me not to read a book, I'm like, right, I'm going there and reading it right now, <laughs> which actually uh, one of my other, one of my other people I know um, did in fact go, oh, you're going to forbid me to read this book, right, I'm going to read it right away. <laughs> so. it, it became a situation where it became a dividing line in sort of the Gardnerian Wicca Seekers group. Yep. And a debate happened behind the scenes about whether they should either A, remove the person who did those things, or B, ask that uh, groups listed uh, note whether or not they are inclusive. And I was in that camp. Just say it if you are or aren't. Yeah, same. It became fairly ugly. I was mostly ignoring it, of course, but I would get messages from people. They ultimately decided it was that person's right as an autonomous third degree to uh, be exclusionary. Uh, to threaten trans people to be a racist and and shut out people of color from our craft uh, that it was their right to make that choice so i left that group and every other group affiliated with our tradition so i've, I've sort of considered myself a an independent agent for a while <laughs> yeah i mean i i went through a similar battle um, as you may or may not know in that um <laughs> I'm not yeah. surprised. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, um, I mean, funny enough, uh, you might you might the the people think that the reason that I left the um, Gardnerian Initiates group on Facebook um, was because um, because they were at the time, which I think I think it's all much better now. Um, as far as I can tell, um, I think the the inclusive side has largely won. Um, but like when I started with the inclusive stuff in 2014, 
people were saying oh you know if you if you want to do that you should just you should just go and form a different tradition and i'm like no i'm gardnerian i've been gardnerian since 1991 um the um the group that i was in um was like yes they told people to stand boy girl boy girl and all that stuff but there was there was as little gendered language as possible um and um you know um thankfully my high priestess has been very supportive of, of all my books and, and stuff um but anyway i was like well, you know i'm gonna sit here i'm i'm as bloody gardnerian as the next person i just choose to not emphasize some of the same things as you and also i've expanded on what i learned i've expanded on what i you know, I haven't taken anything away from the core thing that or at least what i consider to be the core thing um and so what happened was that they um um i said i'm not moving if you want to be exclusionary you leave and do something different um and i believe that that's actually what's happened um but what i did was i formed my own facebook group um inclusive um you know the inclusive worker discussion group on facebook which is still going uh even though i'm not on facebook anymore and the reason i left facebook was because of the cambridge analytica thing um but the reason i actually left the gardnerian initiates group was because there were people posting um fake facebook profiles of dead gardnerians like gerald gardner and dorian valiente and stuff and I really, really, and they thought that was funny to post like witty stuff, you know, about that that person was supposed to have said. And I object to that because I think it's disrespectful to the dead. Um, and I was accused of having no sense of humor and blah, blah, blah. And that was the point at which I actually drew the line and went, right, I'm off. Um, because, um, you know, um, not putting words into the mouths of the dead is super important to me um I think and, and that's why i left i think that's something the that we that would have a lot of com in common you know? yeah I, i'm a big advocate for the dead and the dead's rights and... yeah um i thought you might appreciate <laughs> but yeah I like a number of people were like yeah well why have you got such a sense of humor failure about this and i'm like because it's disrespectful to the dead. Um, and that's not right. I'm Just so, not right, because they can't speak for themselves. I don't know what people say since I'm not in their groups. I think people probably think I left because of something else that was happening at the same time. But I, I try and frequently state for the record that it was over this inclusivity issue. But um, I, yeah, was I mean, to be honest, I probably would have left over there ridiculous attitude to lgbt people at the time um which has improved it's improved. distinctly in many many cases it has to be said um and also i've i've also advocated that people should if they are inclusive you know they should state that on their on their adverts on mandragora magica and on their website because otherwise how would people know i agree and also state what you are inclusive of Correct. That's important. Yes. I, think, um, I don't know. It's it's also messy, but yeah. I also see this other sort of issue in in that we have more inclusivity, and more is more, even if more isn't much. You know. Yeah. I see a lot of bioessentialism in the arguments, which I find very concerning, particularly yeah. as a binary person, but. It is not for anyone else to dictate what defines someone, mm. the trans community, um, the non-binary community, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these debates behind the scenes that rage on about surgeries and this, that, and the other thing, I think, are distasteful at best. And yeah, works. like somebody else's surgery is none of your business unless they choose to share it with you. The, the amount of times that someone in the gardenerian community has said to me, and I am quoting you're basically a woman or you are basically a high priestess is far too many yeah yeah i mean you are what you say you are and i trust you to, to know what you are and i guess interesting because i um like in our group 
we make most of our activities as non-gendered as possible. So anyone can cast a circle, anybody can do water and salt, um, anybody can, in, a, a person of any gender can invoke a deity onto a, of any gender onto another person of any gender, which takes ages to say, but you know what I mean. Um, I actually require my students to experiment. Yeah, great. I want Excellent. you to have tried everything. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it may be that if you've got somebody who's genuinely cisgender, uh, then then they maybe can't um, right. carry a deity of a very different gender to themselves, but still, um, you know, and, um, and I, I, I also make the quarters non-gendered, um, you know, uh, like as much gender as I can, I mean, I still believe in the goddess because, you know, who says I have to be consistent? Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm also a polytheist, so I believe that you know, multiple deities. Uh, there are multiple deities partly because there are multiple genders. Um, so, something that um, that I do, particularly with my outer court, is you know we all have our set of rituals for outer court or whatever. Um, I give them to them as I was given them. Here, take these. I want to see you do them on your own. I don't really put an emphasis on doing those as a group because I think it's not really useful actually at that particular point do things mm. as a group, but it doesn't have to be that. Yeah. Uh, but my primary work for them is take this and degender it completely. Uh, nice. Set a write up of what this ritual looks like to you as a neutral right, um, which is particularly interested, interesting if you have male students since so many rituals are written from a feminine perspective. Mm. So what is this? What's your perspective of this? And then we'll talk about it after the fact. How did the ritual go for you? Yeah. So they're like writing that. their own set of rituals as they go. Ah. That they don't have at the end. Oh, I might steal that if I may. <laughs> that is pretty good. Yeah, I, I, um, I mean, it's funny because uh, some years ago mm -hmm. uh, I had a student, and and so we were doing all our inclusive stuff, which we got pretty nicely developed by that point. Um, and and she said, you know, I just can't believe that this isn't the norm. Like, why isn't this the norm? I mean you know surely like the rest of Wicca can't be that bad and I said right one of these days we're going to do a full-on hard guard ritual where we're going to make everybody stand boy girl boy girl um, <laughs> and and we're going to do everything in a really gendered way so that you'll get it. <laughs> one thing that um, you were talking about not being um, consistent with the goddess um, I always tell my students um, Believe it however you want to believe it. Absolutely. Practice it however you want to practice it, but teach it with neutrality. Absolutely. Yeah. Pass I mean, as you know, my is, my take is you can be an atheist Wiccan if you want. Exactly. You know, you can be I'm a polytheist as long as you as long as people respect that and don't and don't munge deities together because it annoys me. Um, you know, because like um the thing about British 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 Wicca uh, is that you can have a, you know the 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 two deities are that we hold particularly special to the craft are the patron deities of the craft, but other you know the rituals are very often addressed to and about other deities than those two. Um, we don't get hung up a lot on things like goddess and god lord lady consort etc i find that kind of stuff kind of nonsense but what we do um and maybe this is the deaf care worker in me but i think reducing things to gender it's very reductive right to, to yeah in a way so life and death <laughs> are <Neat>. what we use <laughs> yeah uh, priestesses are utterly replaced with standing in the east standing in the west is the priest and us non-binary folks or folks running the coven alone are standing in the north ah and i teach everyone in my coven to stand in the north metaphorically because so many people run covens alone their working partner is someone who pitches in from time to time um, and i think that the craft is here i'm being terrible people are going to be sending me hate mail tomorrow so um <laughs> that's okay only only people who are inclusive watch my channel I think we're particularly misogynistic. I, the sexism toward men in the craft is, is atrocious, really. 
Yeah, I, mean, sure. I understand the origins and I understand how important those things were from a starting point, but today it's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, so I teach everyone to be a coven leader. We say coven leader, we don't use high priestess as a default for coven leader. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Yes. So standing in the north would be someone who either chooses to work and run a coven alone and therefore has to balance those roles themselves um, or someone who's choosing to embody that space because who they are as a person. Yeah, neat. I mean, um, I like the way you've made that directional. Um, like for us, it's like, you know, if my uh, if my husband wants to, um, who is also my high priest, wants to consecrate the water and salt or do, you know, things that are supposedly feminine, um you know that's fine and and he does that and like i mean to be fair we quite often do default to you know i do the water and salt and then he does incense but um but we also make the consecrations non-gendered as well so um because we tried a whole bunch of different things and ended up with um like i consecrate all the participants with water and salt and then he consecrates everybody with incense um but, you know, every so often we need to switch it up just to go, look, you see, this isn't gendered either. Um, I, I think sort of making things directional too gives, at like least my help, and it gives us an opportunity for someone who's you know, gender fluid or non-binary to say, well, today I'm standing in the East. Um, it lets us know where their energy is just yeah. in a second, like it, it's really helpful. And when you get around to the ever-present complicated question of initiations with non-cis people oh no what do we do yeah like, where are you more comfortable standing in the east or the west like yeah that's neat oh i mean we move around a balance lot. point yeah. right? it's not about genitals we just yeah. have to counterpoint each other are you representing life or death for this initiation like where where are you yeah that's neat i like it I yeah i mean we we've started doing a thing where we um you know we divvy up the roles in the initiation so that um so that we both do it that seems to work um but i think the um like i actually do use the title high priestess um and the reason i do that um is that the term priestix doesn't appeal to me it's just a personal thing but i mean the thing is that annoys me is that the unmarked default in the language is the, always the masculine um but I, I also note that the reclaiming tradition refers to everybody as priestesses, regardless of gender, which I thought was quite clever. Um, and it would bother me, though. Just... Yeah, it, I mean, the thing is, I'm so rarely referred to as that anyway, that it doesn't really matter. Um, and then also, um, so the term priestess is uniquely refer, used to refer to pagan officiants as it were um so um and i just like if anyone called me a poetess i would fight them um <laughs> because yes. thankfully the word poet is now gender neutral um but yeah like i think it's because the, the x suffix just also is feminine in latin so it is you're right yes you're so right. my brain's just going nope can't do the grammar on that one sorry um but that's just me and i'm you know if somebody else wants to be a priest then i'm obviously going to refer to them as that and that's totally fine um i'm also just i'm being contrary for people who use these gender defaults as well yeah, yeah. terrible and i get i got so much hate mail about my book <laughs> because... wow oh my god I, I i honestly think that i've got some kind of like either i don't know how it happens i mean probably the fact that i left facebook in 2018 must must be a thing but like i have never got any hate mail i mean i got lots of hateful comments on facebook on but never nobody ever actually direct messaged me and sent me hate mail which feels like way worse but i, I got some um, i don't know if you've had a chance to read my book i have not yet i'll happily send you a copy if you like oh thanks so, yeah, you know afterwards I have a spare um, copy of mine as well, so yeah. But cool. I have um, I have a section in there of death rituals that I wrote for the Gardnerian tradition. <clears throat> and that's complicated, right? Because 
we can neither confirm nor deny that any exist, what they might look like, what they might be, but what happens to someone like my spouse if I were to die today, tragically? I'm a third degree Gardnerian priestess. They are not an initiate. How do they honor me? What does that look like? Yeah. How, how do they get to be involved? What's a roadmap for a coven leader to provide rituals for the dead in a public fashion? What are those mm. look like? So I have, a, it's ostensibly British traditional Wicca, not Gardnerian, but being a Gardnerian, obviously that's my headspace, but yeah. Um, I use terms like efficient and high priestess throughout and I do not at any point use any gendered language and a lot of the hate mail I got was about that specifically what is this how dare you um I've never heard of this stuff before and uh people calling publicly for me to be ousted <laughs> just wow. all kinds of ridiculous stuff uh, what is wrong with people like oh uh I, I got, um, there's a particular person who I shall not name in the United States who stirs up a lot of trouble all of the time. <laughs> and um, they had a lot of very public things to say about my use of priestics. Um, wow. And whether or not it uh, discluded me from my tradition, if I should be reculed for. <laughs> for uh, hey, I want to say, like, recooling was invented by Monique Wilson. Um, you know, no. British Wiccan, as in a Wiccan from Britain, would ever use the term recooling, nor, you know, like, yes, we might, with, with, we would withdraw a vouch under certain circumstances, um, but, you know, recooling was invented in North America, just so you all know. You know what, I think. I mean, <laughs> also, I like, you recall people for, for, like, being abusers or something not right, exactly. or you know being a, a um or in my case withdrawing a vouch I mean you know I have only once withdrawn a vouch um I, and that is because the person that I withdrew the vouch for was going around telling lies about me um, I, I withdrew a vouch once and it was for someone that I uh came to learn was abusing their children yeah and there true. were there were other factors such as alerting the authorities <laughs> yeah for sure but i mean yeah and, and you know i know other people who have withdrawn vouchers from people um because that person was abusive or you know sexually inappropriate and um, exactly same and thing I, but that it should be retained for serious things like that i think that's the thing about british traditional craft is that it's both wonderful and terrible that we don't have a central authority Yes. because who says that the third degree so and so of such and such is like dangerous we don't have anyone to say that yeah and and also what tends to happen is that like a group of people will get behind the the survivor of an abuse situation right. and will say right okay we're supporting this person and we we will not have anything to do with the abuser right. um and yet there will be other people going oh but that person's such a nice person like they can't have done that well you know just because it's the old adage just because someone is nice to you doesn't mean that they are um doesn't mean that they were nice to the person that's that's complaining of them and and what happened to believe survivors you know right and and i think it's really important when we when someone says, you know, behind the scenes, this person was very transphobic to me, or this person was whatever. I mean, we need yeah. to hear that. Absolutely. And and I think, yes, while recoupment is sort of a ridiculous, overblown like thing, we do need a tool for those situations. Yeah, I just and call it withdrawing a vouch. It has that's to be all. used properly though. And <laughs> yes. that's not something that happens, which is yeah. I don't know, there's the, the whole system with queens which here we are back in gendered whatever land yeah that's very big in my line long island line has that tradition and um, it is unique to long island let me say i now have um two third degrees beneath me and two maiden covens beneath me and they've been tooling around with the idea of of, of naming me such but 
it's gendered and I don't want the term. So they've been jokingly calling me my liege forever, which is hilarious. I That's love so it. cool. <laughs> one of my um one of my uh, trainees um decided that that I should be addressed as my leash. <laughs> like, that's very sweet of you, but like, please don't. Because <laughs> um, yeah, also like, I have to say that calling people lady something or other is, is, yeah. is not done in the UK. Because like, we don't want, we've got too much aristocracy in the UK. We don't need any more of it, thank you. Like they stole all the land and then they displaced half the population to North America where so they could steal other people's land um this I is not right a, i think that's a huge silent factor in the popularity of those ideas in the united states too where you have these people who are who are displaced and have come from this heritage of of having so little mm. i mean yes we are a nation of white people with tons of privilege who come from people stealing stuff but i mean so many of us are so very disconnected from that yeah. and who just I mean, my grandparents, great grandparents, and so on, came here as Cromwell era indentured, and it's like they didn't want to be here at all. No, for sure, <laughs> absolutely. Made, so. and, like I know several people who came to Canada as as British home children, um, which sounds nice until you realise that what it means is free labour um, that can't that can't go home. My uh, great great grandparents were 11 and 13, respectively, when they were married to each other and sent here. Wow. They couldn't be sent on a ship as unaccompanied children, but if they were married, they could be sent wow. here. Wow. That means that's even, that was even legal to marry. They were sent here uh, as labor for the Southern Railroad Company. Wow. My 11 year old great great grandfather was blowing dynamite through the Blue Ridge Parkway. Um, wow. It's just it's un it's unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, like not in a you know, not that I don't believe you, but I mean, it's just like it's, it's hard to get your head round. <laughs> but then we we have all that sort of heritage, right? And yeah, then we have this situation where within your own faith practice, you can become something that feels grand or feels important, and it's both wholesome and terrible, like just depending yeah. on the person and their perspective. But yeah, I mean, I can see that. I just you know, like. Uh, I spent the first 49 years of my life in the UK um, where we'd all quite like to get rid of the aristocracy because and the monarchy because they suck uh, mm -hmm. and they are leeches upon the land and you know they're an absolute disaster area and and they need to be stopped at least that's my perspective <laughs> so, we've got our own sprinkling of the aristocracy now that one of the princes is living here and yes out on the news telling people to quit their jobs <laughs> yeah you can't afford to do that sir <laughs> yeah yeah i mean yeah i've got a soft spot for the for the ginger one but um uh yeah i think we all do of course but yes. a little a little out of touch a bit <laughs> yeah a bit yeah, bless him um but, yeah, yeah well hopefully megan will keep him real at least a little bit um, on, the, on the topic though of that idea of of queens or whatever that is mm -hmm. i mean it, it seems like we have a system that could be put in place to protect people beneath them from abusive situations by um putting aside someone who's a, a bad actor but uh, it seems like none of them want to use that role in that way. Yeah. It's yeah, a, I mean, I, it's interesting because the um, the assembly of the sacred wheel, which is a Wiccan tradition that uh, Emphis book belongs to, um, they recently did, they do have a council that that's like, you know, presumably democratically, uh, a democratically created um and they recently put through a resolution that um that anti-racism was a good thing and that um they should they you know, like be avowedly anti-racist and also um pleasingly they adopted the title high priestix as a as an official title that you can be right um yeah good people we like them um so you know i think that and and obviously they do have as well as all of that they do have uh a certain degree of covenant autonomy um so i think it's possible to have your cake and eat it 
Right. And, and in my own coven, it's, I'm sure someone out there is like, are they even Gardnerian? I don't know. <laughs> oh God, if I had a, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said inclusive Wicca isn't Gardnerian, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, no, because I mean, it, you know, I'm a Gardnerian, right? But, um, or, or even inclusive Wicca isn't Wicca um, because you're not doing all this gendered stuff. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I'm using, I'm casting a circle, I'm calling the quarters. Um, we are doing Wiccan things. <laughs> I'm doing Wiccan things, so it's Wicca, right? And, um, you know, unless they've actually been to my circle and, well, newsflash, they ain't going to get an invite to my circle anyway. But unless they've actually been to my circle or actually read my stuff where I talk about what it is I do, um, then how do they know that it's right. Wiccan or not? No, I, I, um, what like, I said there was that, that yeah, I might be a teacher, but we're peers. I'm not teaching children. Yeah. Several of my students are far older than I am, and I feel just terrible about it. Yeah. That's such a funny dynamic, right? To be, you know, 39 and teaching someone who's almost 60. <laughs> yeah. You just feel apologetic about it. But we're very democratic. I don't yeah. take on a new person without giving everyone a vote, an opportunity yep. to meet them and talk to them. Same. I would never put someone out of my coven without giving everyone an opportunity to discuss it, take a vote Same. Uh, with that person present to speak for themselves. Yeah. And that has happened once. Um, we try and be very democratic and um with the third degrees that have hived off of me i try and we stay in contact and we try and be very democratic about what everyone is doing and i hope that the future of my line should i have one is that um we've we've fostered an environment that is both inclusive and and democratic in that way where we yeah, have system absolutely i mean like you know i'm i'm very keen on making the hierarchy as flat as possible you know the reason i have authority in any sense is because i know my stuff it was given you yeah you yeah, it, but it, it yeah it. like I, it it didn't come automatically um because i decided to start a coven I and, often, and yeah absolutely people get a vote on these things i tell my students often that i'm not any better than the brand new professor at the community college i just happen to know something that i can teach and gift you um the rest of the time you do not have to like me and i'm not important <laughs> yeah. well it does help if you if you and your covenants like each other i tend to find we yeah. are very family oriented we're we're a yeah. silly bunch but but happy yeah it sounds great like i mean it sounds like what you do is very very similar to what i do and um you know like we should have had this conversation a long time ago <laughs> right um we were talking earlier though about um i lost my train of thought i'm so sorry <laughs> i'm terrible um what is wrong with my mind i can't maintain words lost it it's gone <laughs> yeah oh well there you go um all right so uh you have um it's it's time to tell people about all the things so you have uh a website um mortellus.com um you have a blog you have a podcast a crow in the dead right uh instagram account a crow in the dead um i've already added those to the slides that i the I top and tail the interview with um and do you have a forthcoming book on the go or anything do you cool. um, for reasons unknown to me Llewellyn keeps letting me <laughs> write things I just signed two more contracts in addition to the four or five or six I was already sitting on so that's wow. crazy to me that I have deadlines until like 2030 which is that's terrifying I yeah. know it's, it's so scary but uh, the next book I have coming out comes out in September of next year. It's already finished. Um, cool. Called The Bones Fall in a Spiral. Ooh. A Guide to Necromancy and the Magic of Death. Wow. That sounds very cool. Yeah, yeah that is amazing. Um, I, do, I do like your titles. I think um, I'm, I'm a big fan of long titles. <laughs> and uh, that that's that's a very good title i like it a lot each of them has a silly story which i'll happily tell your viewers 
uh, Do I Have to Wear Black was so named because of a conversation I walked in on once. <clears throat> I walked into a room where some funeral directors were having a conversation about attending a Wiccan funeral. And they were saying that it, it gave them the willies, it, it creeped them out. And they were saying that the high priestess all in black was very scary. And here I was thinking this was probably this person just wearing whatever dress they owned, you know, it's just yeah. very ordinary. Everyone wears black to funerals. Yeah. And this person quipped, if I go to a Wiccan funeral, do I have to wear black? And I thought to myself at the time that was ridiculous because, well, black is such a common morning color. We all wear yeah. black funerals. But if you're pagan, it's satanic, it's evil. There's something wrong with it. Yeah. Why do we have to grieve differently? And I thought if that's the question they have, I'll answer it. So yeah, that's good. The bones fall in a spiral is a much sillier origin. I'm a big fan of tabletop gaming and within the world of uh, Pathfinder, that's a Paizo company, which is very similar to Dungeons and Dragons. Um, there is a fictional death deity named Phrasma. And Phrasma's holy text within that fictional world is called The Bones Fall in a Spiral. Ah, neat. I like that a lot. Oh, it's good. Asked, well, it sounds very pagan, doesn't it? I asked the company's permission to use the title. I didn't have to. We, I could have used it, but um, I wanted their permission and they gave it. They cool. thought it was very, very, very awesome. Yeah. Well, that sounds, that sounds really great and very enjoyable. I'm, so, I'm a big advocate of playful magic. Absolutely, be, yeah, we, mirth and reverence, right? We should be fun, have fun with your magic. It doesn't all have to be self-serious. And yeah. I've learned better than most that life is very short and we should live every day of it and you know, have joy and mirth where we can. Absolutely, yeah, I totally agree. Um, yeah, like, uh, I really like the thing in Guardians of the Galaxy 2 where he says people should stop walking around with sticks up their butts. <laughs> Agreed. I, I tell people often, I, I once um, embalmed someone, served the funeral of a person who was barely in their 20s, very young person who um, had their whole life laid out in front of them, engaged to be married, just finished their college degree, ready to start a career. Aww. They ran some errands. They were healthy. They got their groceries, came home. Everything was fine. They put a key in their front door, unlocked it, tripped with their one bag of groceries, broke their neck and died. Oh my God. You do not know when your time is up. Yeah. Enjoy the time that you have. Absolutely. And live every day like it was your last. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I guide, um, I have somebody on my ancestor altar who sadly died at the age of 27. And I always say, like she shouldn't be on there because she should have had more time because she was such a lovely person as well um but i like to think that she's still with us in spirit kind of thing when we fill out toe tags for the dead you wind up with quite a few duplicates you come out on a sheet and most of them will wind up in the garbage because they're not needed you know so i always bring one home and i have an altar that has a tag hanging for every single deceased person I have uh, participated in the burial rites of, and it's quite a lot. But wow, I love that. Ancestor altar is very populated. <laughs> yes, I love that so much. That is really great. Beautiful thing to do. I don't. Ah. I I feel like uh, the work that I do is is magical in nature. It's something that I do in service to the dead. It's something I do in service to the gods. So. I never want them to be forgettable or forgotten or just numbers or just a day at work. I make sure I remember every single name, even when it's a lot of them. And it yeah. has been in this pandemic. Yeah, for sure. That is beautiful. I really love that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So good. Yeah, I mean, it's just so, you know, um, there's a wonderful line from the Popol Vuh, which um, there's a Mexican, um, Mayan text about the dead and the dead say um do not forget us um you know and I just think that one of the most important things we can do is is to remember them and you know fix their 
uh, you know, fix their legacy or, or continue their legacy if it's a good one and and try to try to heal the the, the gap the that they left behind kind of thing. Um, we could we could get into a whole other conversation. We about totally, yeah, we totally could. Um, I think a lot of, of the work of necromancy is about being in service to the dead, and mm. I think that necromancy can't help but be about life. Yeah, for and sure. I think that's that's so important. And in a lot of ways, it really comes back around to the gender issue, right? Because when we're talking about living and dying, we can't talk about we can't talk about that without thinking about birth, right? Of course, mm. and those sorts of regenerative things. But um, I think it is about recognizing what we have and the beauty and fragility of it. And yeah. And on the topic of just kind of queer subjects, I, I that opinion was called heretical by a third degree recently. Um, I, I had read them a passage in my upcoming book and. And it talks a bit about that and, and they thought it was a heretical idea which i thought was really funny the idea that wow. we have ideas that could be, <laughs> could yeah. be heretical was wow i'm i just think it's you know it breaks my heart when people get all dogmatic about the craft um you know there are many books of shadows gardner gave at least five different books of shadows to five different people um you know Every, as far as I'm concerned, every witch's book of shadows, every Wiccan's book of shadows should be unique to them, um, you know, and also pass on everything, like, even if you don't like it, I was taught that, um, you know, and because somebody else might like it further on down the line. Um, I'm a big advocate of that as well, and and I ask my students, don't, don't email me things, don't give me all this nonsense. You write to me. I want letters. I want cards because we keep them all. We archive them, scan them. Because I think about the what we know about our forebears. It's it's all these letters and journals. Yes. And, and if we're not doing the same, then we're not telling our story in our own words. And I think that's so 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 important for for the queer community for the LGBTQ right. Yeah. Community. Because if we're not writing things down, then we don't exist. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the reasons I've been making this queer magic series of interviews is because the queer story and the queer history is, isn't told widely enough. And also because, um, you know, there are things that happened in the 80s and 90s um, that need to be told because people don't know. And like, you know, it's interesting that we both, you and I both went through the same bullshit with some members of the Gardnerian community. Uh, and yet I didn't know that had happened to you and you didn't know that had happened to me. Right. And so if we hadn't had this conversation, then- We'd have gone on not knowing it. We'd have gone on not knowing, <laughs> yes. Um, it's funny, like uh, one of the few things I knew about you was someone quipping to me one day that you didn't like the term priestess and or priestess. And therefore I thought, did they don't like me? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was all that was all I knew without context. Yeah. yeah, well that's the thing. It's like, you know, it's not that I don't um yeah, well, you know, it's like all the stuff I've done a lot of work on polarity because after the first book I put out, um people said, Oh, but what about polarity? Because I was talking about how we should make Wicca more inclusive, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um and uh and so I did a lot of work on showing that polarity doesn't have to be about gender and in fact is nothing to do with gender. Um, so somebody got the wrong end of the stick and thought that that meant that polarity was really important to me. And I'm like, no, I just did a bunch of workshops on it to show that it's nothing to do with gender. <laughs> so so yeah. here's a thing that I, I'll, I'll offer a hot take to, <laughs> to the listeners. Everybody thinks that Wicca is very binary. Mm. And therefore that's what we're railing against, right? But I don't think Wicca is binary at all. Yeah. I think Wicca is extremely skewed to the feminine in an unhealthy way. Yeah. Would you like to hear the passage that was very heretical? I think it's really relevant. Oh, yes, yes. More heresy. Oh, and I have to say that also the original meaning of her of a heresy 
was a heresis or a school of thought. Well, here we go. Strap in for a school of thought, y'all. You'll learn a little. You'll learn a little bit about my take on Gardnerian work by hearing this. In Forbidden Rights, a Necromancer's Manual of the 15th century, Richard Keckheffer writes that the rights contained in a manual of necromancy are flamboyantly transgressive, even carrying transgression toward its furthest imaginable limits. And I thought of that line when sharing a portion of the rituals herein, only to be told that they seemed heretical. This was particularly funny to me at the time, given that the person saying as much was also Gardnerian Wiccan, and the idea that we might have an orthodoxy that one might commit heresy against in the first place is absurd. You see, heresy is to have an opinion profoundly at odds with generally accepted orthodoxy, beliefs or practices generally accepted to be correct. I can't get a dozen witches in my living room to agree on a type of pizza, least of all a dozen covens to agree on what is a correct practice for Wiccans, Gardnerian or otherwise. But where it really falls apart for me is the idea that necromancy, or rather my personal take, is profoundly at odds with Wicca. Oh no, you think to yourself, recalling the prologue in which I insisted that this book was not fluffy. Yes, the practice is foundationally Wiccan, and I won't be apologetic about it. Am I Wicca washing necromancy? Absolutely not. It's a choice. It's purposeful. Classically Wiccan rituals have at the least been led by a pair of individuals with one ostensibly representative of life and the other death. And somewhere between lies a balance of reincarnation, rebirth, and a story of creation. And so it was that I found myself considering rather than what makes a ritual necromantic, considering instead what makes the ones we are all too familiar with about life. The general construct of a magic circle is reasonably straightforward declare your intentions, consecrate needed items, cast a circle, call quarters, invoke necessary figures, do intended work, make offerings, close the space. But on a more metaphorical level, a magic circle could be described as a great clock, midnight set in the east, entrances, beginnings, turning on a pivot point. This circle and its quarters neatly laid out represents a build of energy, upward, round and round, right hip to the altar as we move clockwise creating, but why? Life is linear, and as we move forward in our inexorable march toward death, the hands of this clock move ever forward. The right hand in which we hold our athami positions our body's inferior vena cava toward the center, a reminder that is as nature's way, we are dying. Historically, necromantic rituals rely on the concept of invoking death as a return and therefore of reversals. What does it mean to turn life-oriented magic on its head? Our clock face is reoriented. Midnight now in the West. We begin and end circumnambulation there. The cross-quarter compass laid out across its face is now a crossword roads, a path by which the dead might travel to and from this space. A thami in the left hand, we move counterclockwise around, now anchored to the magic circle, the side of the body, on which lies the descending aorta, from which life-giving oxygenated blood flows into our bodies, the left atrium of the heart having revived, raised from the dead, lifeless deoxygenated blood within the context of our own natural system. What then is functionally different about a necromantic ritual? Walking our ritual back in time, we begin with libations and end with consecrations. Rather than building up a cone of power, our energy reverse spirals into the cavernous depths of the earth. In many folk practices, one danced counterclockwise around a grave to summon the dead and commune with them. Here, we dance around an altar, a bowl of grave dirt at its center. The shades of the dead spun upward to walk the path we have laid down for them. An necromantic ritual is, in essence, adjusting your intention and turning its magic on its head. The center of the circle now truly a fulcrum point upon which we might declare mastery over both polynogenesis and death. Just because necromantic magic operates on a system of reversals does not make it a perversion. Rather, that to have no elements of death at all is the perversion. We have forgotten that death is part of the balance. For as Samuel Beckett said in Waiting for Godot, we give birth astride a grave. Light gleams in an instance, and then it's night once more. Necromancy isn't really about death. It's about birth. 
For any magic that is about life will always be about decay. And the magic of death cannot help but be about living. Wow. That is, that is genius. That is, ah, I love it. So that's um, my necromantic magic. That's my Gardnerian Wicca. Yeah. That's my non-binary Wicca. Absolutely. I love it so much. Like, that is brilliant. And, and, oh, um, I love it. Uh, Hey, I'm a heretic too. Yay. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I think we that. knew that. But like yeah, that is so powerful. And it's so um like I have my uh elements in a different place. So I'm but we absolutely have the concept of the clock, of the circle being a clock. That is one of our things, right? So I'm like, okay, how can I adapt that to my to the way my the elements go on my circle? That is brilliant. And like we forget. That is, awesome we forget that we say the lord of death and resurrection we forget that and we reduce him to an erection yeah well we not personally that, but yes people well, do that <laughs> you take that out of the equation yeah and life and death creation and destruction yeah we changed our circle none at all but made it so much more powerful yeah absolutely like that is amazing like you've created yeah. a you've created a new depth and a new layer and uh I love that so much. It's brilliant. The idea of making your circle a space where it could function forward and backward, depending on the ritual you're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like, I'm, uh, I'm left handed, so I'm not wedded to this whole we must hold our Athemi in our right hand malarkey. Because um, I, I, and I will change it to you're holding the Athemi in your dominant hand. Right. I so people talk about the right hand, left hand magic all the time, and the right hand, yeah. left hand, mommy. That's actually a big pet peeve of mine because because of what i say here if we think about the body system nobody talks about that we don't talk about our body as part of our magic yeah but, but it had, is i've had to autopsy people so i've seen i've seen in there i've touched you know yeah the venus return on the right side of your body is toxic void of oxygen void of health so when we're holding our Athami in that hand, it becomes about decay, right? We yeah. are affecting energetically through our body in a way that is really meaningful there because I do think it's about following the natural course of things, the natural order, mm. walking time forward. Um, life is about decay because yeah. thing is about dying fundamentally. But when you switch the blade to the other hand, and we're looking at that descending aorta, which is taking that disgusting, nasty blood and bringing it back to life. Mm. We're talking about resurrection. Right. We're talking about reanimation. Yeah. Your heart resurrects you from the dead every six seconds. Wow. Every six seconds, you are always six seconds away from death. Always. Wow. Because that's what your heart does. Yeah every moment you are about three minutes away from suffocating to death wow you just manage to take a breath every time just when you need to so yeah. when you hold that knife in that hand you truly become the horned god master of death master of reanimation spinning wow. that energy down into the earth and holding that knife in the right you become indicative of the goddess hmm walking time forward as it should to your death yeah you're born again it's complete when you yeah love that um still gonna make it dominant hand <laughs> non-dominant hand um i mean the thing is i think like also i think the i don't know about the way i mean i'm assuming that the body is configured like a left-handed person's brain may be configured differently um but our bodies are generally the same way around as a right-handed person um oh. It's actually unusual for your organs to be flipped. It can. Yeah. It's very, very rare. Yeah, but your brain can be like wired differently for sure. Handedness, uh, right hand, left hand, is determined in utero by the, the growth direction of your spine. As your spine forms, handedness. Ah. Fun fact, I was left-handed as a child, um, but it was not deemed acceptable. So my, my hand was broken. So I learned to, to write right-handed. 
but they actually deliberately broke your hand so that you would write. Right. You probably see my, maybe not see my scars, but I have. Oh I have my them. God. Closed my hand on a door so I would learn to, to write right handed. I no. can't even begin to fathom the cruelty of doing that to someone. I feel sort of a uh, mixed bag. I can use either hand, but I write better with my right hand because I just learned to. Wow. Oh. That's sort of, I, I think those sort of things play into our magic, queer magic, play into how we look at Wicca and the strange mm. emphasis on the feminine, on the high priestess, how we treat men in a craft. I think all those things come together as part of that puzzle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that without changing anything about our magic, we can adjust our perspective. And I think that's, that's powerful. Yeah, for sure. I mean, definitely. I think that, um, I think your idea of the, the inverse spiral of power is just such a powerful idea. Like I was visualizing it straight away and going, yes. wow, like that is amazing. Um, I'm sure other people out there have had that thought in their head, but but it's always been what has worked for me. And yeah, well, you discovered it and articulated it. And I mean, I've always I've never been particularly kind of hung up on we must not walk Widdish in like I'm people like look at me because I walk Widdish in all the time and they go, oh, and I'm like, shut up. <laughs> I do think it really depends on the magic you're trying to do. As yes, well. for sure. Well, obviously, if I'm deliberate. OK, so here's the thing. Um, if I'm trying to do something where I'm trying to build up energy, then for sure I will walk, walk Deshaw. But I, um, you know, I am not one of those people who were like, OK, I'm over here in the circle. I need to go and get something from over there. If, it, if the shortest route is Widdishans, I'll do it. Um, but so we could build our energy downward. Is, yeah, um, I love the idea. Of, yeah, I think it's I really also, interesting. I was, also, fun fact: like um, Orthodox Christians dance Widdishins around. Like they have a thing where they dance Widdishins around their churches. I didn't know this. <laughs> yeah, and also, if you notice, if you ever go to a very old church in England, um, like I have. I always go and look at the north door because that's supposedly where the pagans were supposed to have gone um and that's why they supposedly they bricked up the north doors interesting yeah um because and for me north is the sacred direction um so when um but i would try and walk around the church uh Jeshul, and um you can't and let without you know because all their paths lead you around Widdishins. Interesting. That is yeah. So yeah, this is super interesting. But yeah, like um I don't think your your uh, reverse your Widdishins ritual um you know it it reminds me of the the Dark Morris um which is, uh I don't know if you're like people in North America don't seem to read Terry Pratchett for some reason. Yay! Um, good to see. I love Mort. Mort is Mort. Oh God, yeah. Well, of course that makes sense. Um, I love death. I think death is brilliant. Um, but yeah, like the whole thing, the whole idea of the dark Morris, where you know the the Morris dancers come out in spring and they wave their hankies and their bells and their sticks and and conjure up the spring, but then at, at Sawain they come along and and dance it all down again silently. With no bells and wearing black, um, I think that's such a powerful idea, and I've always loved it. And um, uh, for Sawin, I actually dressed up as a as a dark Morris dancer because I've I've succumbed to Morris dancing. Um, you could have done my my Widdershins ritual. <laughs> we could have. That would have been great. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I like to do at Sawin is actually have people bring a photo of a deceased loved one and talk about why they loved that person because you never get that opportunity in everyday life and so it's really really important to to bring those stories and and have them heard and then to say the person's name like um super something, important something that we do is um i have everyone bring a framed photograph of themselves and um we have our own funerals 
they have to eulogize themselves. Ooh. Which can be very powerful. Mm, I like really that. Thinking, thinking about yourself in that way and your your own accomplishments, what your life has been, and sort of looking at it laid out. Is this what I would want to be remembered as? And yeah. Um, it, it can be really, really powerful. That's very powerful. I like it a lot. I That's mentioned brilliant. it briefly in passing, but uh, um, using the bowl of grave dirt instead of flowers. Um, we always put flowers for the goddess, but we don't necessarily put anything for the god. And uh, that bowl of earth is a place from which flowers spring and using grave earth where bodies have decayed and and it's that sort of regenerative nature. I always have a bowl of grave dirt for, for the horn god. So. Mm, like it. Well, one of my things is I never used to like the idea of the skull and and now I have a, I have lots of I mean they're not real skulls because you can't get hold of real skulls right but I have a, well okay you can <laughs> um anyway I have a collection of skulls now um and the skull is now important to me in my practice so I'll introduce you to my friend This is um, an osteological specimen from a medical school that was vandalized by teenagers, so it is quite broken. Oh. And was unfortunately bound for this, the incinerator because of the damage. So I, I brought them home. They're, they're my friend. Oh. oh, hello, Skull. They've got a nice altar back there and spend yeah. some time with me. So they're my writing buddy. That's great. I love it. That's I so cool. I've so much enjoyed talking to you, I really have. Yeah, well, I'm really glad that we did. It was completely awesome. Um, it made it so worth much. my quippy tweet, tweet post if anyone would chat with me. That would make totally worth it for this combo. <laughs> Definitely. And we covered many fine things. Um, yeah, and I think we should I think we should talk again, too. I think that'd I be like great. It. I yes. like it so much. Yeah. And please send me your address. I'll send you a book. Oh, It'd great. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be lovely. And likewise. So, yeah, thank you so much.